One of the mob's weapons of psychological warfare is humiliation and ritual public shaming. And I'm not just talking about social media cancel culture. I'm talking about literal public shaming in public. <laughs> Wouldn't it be chilling if the exact same tactics used by the Red God during the psychological terror campaign of China's Maoist cultural revolution were being used today? Yes, it would. And yes, they are. During the Cultural Revolution, dissidents and opponents of the revolution were publicly humiliated and shamed in the streets by baying mobs of Marxist-Leninist agitators. At the time, these displays were known as struggle sessions. The goal was to use verbal and physical abuse to force the accused into expressing both physical and ideological fealty and ultimately confessing their thought crimes. So what were the characteristics of Maoist struggle sessions? The mob would subject the target to repeated rhythmic chants as a form of re-education. <laughs> The mob would force the target to kneel, which is another form of ritual public shaming. <laughs> They ordered us to get down on our knees. So if they see that a white person is getting on their knees, that shows solidarity for the situation. The situation. And could you just please apologize for, you know, for your white privilege? Just apologize? I am. Cut oh. Here it is, right here. There you go. <laughs> Mr. White Man, get these white women. They forced my parents to kneel. No, 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 no. no. The target was made to wear blackboards describing their alleged crimes and sins. The highest ranking victims were brought out for public humiliation before mass meetings in a football stadium. They wore placards around their necks with their names crossed out like common criminals. You want to get fucked up tonight? Would you still want the flag up? Don't look at me in my eyes. What is this? What's wrong with you, son? We'd seen a lot of this in revolutionary films as we were growing up. The target who professed their innocence, maybe by refusing to conform to groupthink and mob intimidation, was regarded by the Maoists as the most guilty. Official crimes! Nothing to confess. I can remember as though it were yesterday watching a group of strongly built students, including some of my own classmates, boys who practiced martial arts. Mao keep taught us they have to receive the re-education. We demand you! We demand you! I really wanted to beat him because I felt such hatred. The past was still too close. Look at what they're doing. Look at this. This is this is Marxism, cultural Marxism to a T. They create, they create, they create the unrest. And then they get upset when someone actually speaks up for themselves. And now they've ruined a peaceful evening. We had live music out here. They're ruining this evening just because someone actually spoke up for himself. Who said all lives matter? This white boy. The dude with the greasy ass hair. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter.
The mob would be incited to target landowners, who they were indoctrinated to believe were the architects of their oppression. Those rounded up were made to write self-denunciations. They wore names on their backs. Capitalist. Landlord. Mao argued that the peasant violence was an inevitable response to landlord oppression. To redress past wrongs, it was necessary to go to extremes. The mob would be incited to attack religious shrines. Throughout the country, churches were closed, clergy unfrocked, religious symbols smashed. Temples and shrines were ransacked. Despite official designation as cultural treasures, The mob would be encouraged to erect their own murals and shrines to honor and ordain their ideological deities. The statue of the Virgin Mary was replaced by a portrait of Mao. One form of worship gave way to another. The goal of the mob was to rid the country of the old ideas by enacting reverse cultural imperialism. There was to be a new revolution, a cultural revolution, a revolution in people's thinking. All ideas contrary to Mao's thinking and the objects that represented them had to be destroyed. Many irreplaceable objects were destroyed. Instance, fall from grace. Also statues of David and the like, the kind used in drawing classes. The rebels were full of themselves. They struck poses as they smashed everything. Not just by attacking the ideas, but by physically attacking the people, buildings and icons that represent those ideas and replacing them with their own. Zhou Enlai's implicit distinction between smashing bourgeois ideas and smashing bourgeois individuals was quickly forgotten. He wrote young red card fighters go out on the streets. That is the old ideas, old culture, old customs and old habits left over by the old society which spread feudal poison and symbolized imperialist aggression and capitalist exploitation. And the people sinned a great sin for they had made them a god of gold. And they bore him upon their shoulders and rejoiced, saying, this be our god. The mob would be incited to attack shops and businesses perceived not to be fully supporting their cause. They're destroying old shop signs and replacing them with revolutionary ones. There was a famous hair salon. It displayed photographs of all kinds of hairdos. When the Cultural Revolution came, they were seen as examples of bourgeois decadence. A group of Red Guards took over the place. We own this building, that building, that building, and this building, which are all, all destroyed. The mob would be incited to target street signs and lobby for street names to be changed. In doing so, re-educating their class enemies to be ashamed of their heritage. The scum and dregs, such as street names, insulting the Chinese people, left by imperialism and revisionism must be completely destroyed. There have been many campaigns across the country, from renaming Liverpool's Penny Lane. We've got to recognise uh, that our public realm, statues, squares, street names, don't accurately reflect our values or, or London in, in 2020. They're putting up quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. The Chinese people will go all out to establish the new ideas, new culture, new customs and new habits of the proletariat. The mob would be incited to believe that looting and stealing is merely the just reappropriation of wealth. We knew our home would be a target sooner or later. We fit the category. 
My parents had both been capitalists. Finally, one day, the Red Guards came charging in and turned our house upside down. This is a business that, that my parents started 40 years ago, small, out of their garage. He didn't do anything to anybody. You know, why did we deserve it? Former capitalists who had long since given up their assets. The local police asked the Minister of Public Security if the Red Guards should be stopped. No, that would be unwise. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that the activities of BLM have reached anywhere near the level of terror dished out by the Red Guard. But I'm starting to notice some similarities. Victims of the Maoist Cultural Revolution were not just publicly shamed for their beliefs, they were executed for them. Of course, that would never happen in America, would it? One person wearing a Patriot prayer hat was shot and killed in Portland last night. We were the fucking Nazis! Our community held its own! Dissidents and thought criminals who refused to cave to the mob were also taken to re-education gulags. Of course, that would never happen in America, would it? They also believed that their immediate responsibility would be to protect against what they called the counter-revolution. And uh, they felt that this counter-revolution could best be guarded against by creating and establishing re-education centers in the Southwest. Uh, where we would take all the people who needed to be re-educated into the new way of thinking and teach them how things were going to be. I ask, well, what is going to happen to those people that we can't re-educate, that are die-hard cap capitalists? And the reply was that they'd have to be eliminated. And when I pursued this further, they estimated that they would have to eliminate 25 million people in these re-education centers. And when I say eliminate, I mean kill 25 million people. Now, I want you to imagine sitting in a room with 25 people, most of which have graduate degrees from Columbia and other well-known educational centers, and hear them figuring out the logistics for the elimination of 25 million people. And they were dead serious. In 1984, George Orwell described the two minutes of hate, which was akin to public shaming training for the citizens of Airstrip 1. The rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, a shaming ritual which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. Just as BLM agitators are able to switch their rage on a whim, from targeting a senator to a diner to an old woman, all seen as being born with original sin, because of their skin colour. The object of Irie could be anyone, writes James Panero. What matters is the display of denunciation and the pitiless scorn that must be arbitrarily shown. The impact of public shaming is also reflected in political polls. In the case of both Brexit and Donald Trump, the polls got it spectacularly wrong. Part of the reason for that was because voters were reluctant to tell pollsters their actual voting preference. Whatever the strength of their private beliefs, public shaming had made people ashamed of expressing support for Brexit exit or Trump. Expect that phenomenon to be repeated in 2020. Ritual public humiliation struggle sessions were happening in China right up until 1978 when reformist Deng Xiaoping abolished them. In Maoist China, without explicitly calling for political violence, the political class was nonetheless able to legitimize and incite it. Even though the editorial neither mentioned the report nor praised violence, it was clear that the extreme actions of the Red Guards were not to be criticized. In the United States, the political class has achieved the exact same thing. No explicit call for violence, but the subtle legitimization and incitement of the mob to carry out Maoist style psychological warfare against the American people. I, I, I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there's unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Go ahead, take you behind the gym and beat the hell out of them. Punch some people in the face! And if you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome. Anymore, anywhere. And now the same political class is using the threat of that same mob 
to intimidate Americans into voting them into power. History doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. <laughs> It's absolutely crucial for you to help me fight the war on free speech by supporting me via subscribe star, link in description, and also signing up for my free newsletter at summit.news forward slash newsletter.